Let's open up to the book of Nehemiah. I should have encouraged you when we got started to try to read through the book of Nehemiah. It's not very long, and maybe you would have been a little more abreast on it. I know a lot of you are probably familiar with it. And uh, these messages are a little more instructional, and um, I hope that the Lord's doing something for you. Amen. Um, and uh, let's see what the Lord might have for us today. I tell you what, I have really enjoyed just the singing, the fellowship, Amen. the messages, yes. Brother Gene's message and Brother Stephen's message this morning. That was great. And uh, I could just sit and listen, soak it up. Uh, but it is a privilege to be able to look in the Bible and we'll look in Nehemiah chapter 4. We've got a little bit of a ground to cover tonight. We're going to look in 4, 5, and 6, okay? But let's read the first six verses, then we'll ask Pastor Jay if you don't mind praying for us after we read the first six verses. The Bible says, But it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, Even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. Hear, O our God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head, and give them for a prey in, in the land of captivity." And cover not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. So built we the wall, and the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. As we think about the whole series, we're looking at the idea of your place of fellowship. The first night we looked at the condition of your place. It is in ruins, in need of repair. Yesterday we talked about the construction of your place, rebuilding from the ground up. Remember, we don't need revival, we need repairable. And now we're going to look at rebuilding and the idea that we've already seen it early on and it's almost like we're beating a dead horse, but you've got to get this. There is going to be conflict over your place of fellowship. We saw it early on, and we especially see it in these three chapters. As soon as you really begin to make some progress, you begin to make some momentum, you make some baby steps, and you stand up for Jesus, and you begin to build a wall, and you get some stuff out, and you really get serious. The devil's not going to just go to sleep and forget about you. He's going to find other ways to try to get you. It never stops. Some of your older Christians in here, I guarantee you'd say amen to this. The Christian life is uphill all the way. It's a fight, brother. It's not a recreation room, as the old song says. It's a battle, not a game. Onward Christian soldiers, this thing's a fight. Paul said, I have fought a good fight. Tells Timothy he has to war a good warfare. You are going to have conflict especially when you make some progress and you begin to rebuild and you've got to defend your place. The devil wants to gain what little bit of ground he can. He says in Ephesians, he says, neither give place to the devil. And so I want us to look at this tonight. We're going to look at these three chapters and there are three areas we're going to deal with. Chapter 4 deals with scorn. Chapter 5 deals with strife. And chapter 6 deals with sedition. Now, the closer you get to building this wall and getting the stuff out so you can keep the right stuff in, the conflict's going to increase more and more. And you're going to have, have to have more than just an opinion. You're going to have to have a conviction. You're going to have to have a conviction. Decisions based on opinions can be reconsidered. Decisions based on convictions will stand. Decisions based on opinions can be reconsidered. And the devil will try to find places that you're soft. 
And he'll move in and he'll try to get you to budge and he'll try to get you to back up just a little bit. To give him a little more ground. To put down the block over there and he'll try to find a little area, a little weak spot that he can have in that wall where he can get in and out. And so this idea of conflict is so sure. We were singing those last couple songs about God of not promised, you know, easy roads and so forth. You think about the trials, the troubles, the tribulations that all Christians face. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, the great prince of preachers, said this, God had one son without sin, but He never had a son without a trial. If you're serious about building this wall, and you're serious about your place of fellowship, you're going to have conflict. And you better get used to it. First one we're going to look at is scorn, chapter number 4. Somebody said ridicule is the language of the devil. Ridicule is the language of the devil. And you know, uh, there's a lot of damage people can do with that mouth right there. The Bible says that nobody can tame the thing. Uh, Scripture tells us to study to be quiet. The best thing you can do is shut your mouth. Some of you just can't stop talking. You just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and squawk and squawk and squawk and squawk and squawk. You just need to shut your mouth. And that idea of ridicule coming in and saying things you shouldn't say and the devil using your tongue to maybe discourage somebody else in their building process and the devil using that tongue to cause scorn and ridicule to stop somebody, he will do that all over the place and we have to see it in our own lives. Scorn. It's the language of the devil. Notice in verses 4 and 5 that as soon as they begin to make fun of this wall, they're like, look, if a fox goes up, he's going to break down that wall. Look at those Bible believers. They're shouting up on top of the mountain, but as soon as they get back down to work, they'll compromise. As soon as they go back to school, they're going to compromise. They're going to leave God up in the mountain where they found Him. That's the devil. That's Tobiah, and that's Sanballat. That's the, these wicked men. As soon as Nehemiah hears this, Notice we have petition. He prays. Somebody pushes you, don't push them back. Somebody pushes you, pray about it. Petition, verse number 4 says, Hear, O our God, we're despised. And he prays. This is one of those imprecatory prayers like you read in the Psalms. It's Old Testament, so I wouldn't encourage you to adopt these <laughs> verses. Because this is basically praying for God to kill and break the teeth out of your enemies. I'm not telling you to do that. I'm telling you, in the New Testament, we need to, be over, we need to overcome evil with good. Pray for those that despise you and despitefully use you. However, the principle is still the same. Turn them over to God. If you try to take anger out on them, you're just going to do it in the flesh. Turn them over to God. God can punish them a whole lot worse than you could ever punish them. Just leave them up to God. He prays. Constantly we find Nehemiah in prayer. You see it again in verse number 9. Nevertheless, we made our prayer. Years ago, there was a young man back when they were doing logging, back before they had all the modern equipment, and they were still felling down trees with the, with the axes. And so he goes up and he wants to get this job, and the guy says, okay, get your axe out, cut down this tree, let me, let me check you out. The guy gets out, this young, big, strong guy, and Man, he goes to work on that tree, and in a matter of minutes, timber knocks the tree down. He says, okay, you got a job. Be here Monday morning. Well, Monday comes around. The guy shows up. Boom, he's knocking them down, going great. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Thursday rolls around. The guy says, come here. He goes over there and says, here's your check. He says, what do you mean, my check? I thought you paid on Friday. He goes, I do, but we're letting you go. You're fired. Here you go. He goes, what do you mean I'm fired? I'm working all that I can do. I'm not even taking lunch break. I'm not taking water breaks. I'm working harder than anybody. He goes, yeah, you're working harder than anybody, but you're not in cutting down as many, near as many trees. You started at the beginning. You're knocking down all these trees. Now you, you're hardly getting any trees down. Let me ask you this, son. Have you sharpened your axe? He's like, I've been too busy working to sharpen my axe. Prayer is when you sharpen your axe. Yeah, I need to work on my prayer life. Yeah, I can confess that. Maybe you need to work on your prayer life. Yes. You can't deal with conflict if you're not in prayer. 
You're going to get your feelings hurt really quick if you can't turn things over to Jesus real quick. If you don't have a good line of communication where He can deflect that scorn and ridicule for you, you're going to, you're going to give up. Amen. Prayer might not always change things that are going around, and it might not always change God, but prayer will change you. He mentioned somebody who was talking about the countenance, brother this morning, about the countenance being changed. Now, next we have aspiration, verse number 6. Let me give you this. This is actually, if you want to take the, the main meat of the points, they have petition, which is what? They had to have a heart to pray. If you're going to endure scorn, you've got to have a heart to pray. Notice the second thing here, aspiration, in verse number 6. In verse number 6, he says, So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together into the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. You've got to have a heart to pray, but number two, you have to have aspiration. You have to have a mind to work. There's a previous decision that led up to a powerful determination. They've already made up their mind. I've already kind of preached on this, so we're treading familiar ground. They've already made up their mind they're going to do this. So when the scorn and the ridicule comes, that affects them a little bit, but they turn it over to God and they keep working. When the scorn comes, you've got to have a mind to work. Y'all know that song, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus? I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. And you always get the kids to shake their heads. We used to sing it in the nursing home. No turning back. No, 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 no turning back. Cross before me, the world behind me, you know, that kind of thing. No turning back. Go ahead and make up your mind. You know, I haven't been tempted by alcohol because I don't drink. I've already made a decision. You know, if you have a problem with Oreo cookies and you've got a problem with sugar and things like that, don't buy it at the grocery store. Don't put it in the cupboard. Then you won't have a problem for late night snacks. You can go in there and eat some ramen noodles or something. Hey, if you go ahead and make up your mind and you make a big decision, it can take care of a whole bunch of little decisions. The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. If you already make up your mind, there are certain types of entertainment that you're not going to expose yourself to. You can go ahead and cut off a lot of stuff. Yeah. But if you say, well, you know, this one might not be too bad. It's just got a bunch of violence in it. Or this one might not be too bad. And you're always back and forth and back and forth. You're going to begin letting stuff in the ear gate and the eye gate. And the gates are going to be opened up for the devil to get in. And he's going to be inside your special place. You've got to make some decisions. You've got to have a mind to work. There was a preacher at that nursing home we used to go to. Preacher Lee was his name. I don't know his full name. We called him Preacher Lee, an old black guy. And we'd let the folks give testimonies. We'd sing a little bit, let them give testimonies. I'd preach a little bit. We'd sing a little more. And he'd always have a great word to say, you know. And he quoted Matthew 22 when Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind. And he said, you know what? He says... If you make up your mind to do that, you won't have time for much anything else. Just make one big decision. And then all the other little decisions will fall in place. So how do you deal with scorn? Well, you've got to have petition. You've got to have aspiration. A heart to pray. A mind to work. G. Campbell Morgan, the great preacher, when preaching on this passage, he said this, earnestness was the central secret of their success. Men who lack enthusiasm will never do anything for God. Men who lack earnestness will never build any wall for God. you got to be made up, made up mind. Paul said, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Notice in verse number 9 there's another thing. Verse number 9. It says, Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. They didn't just pray. Lord, bless my trip. I've got a long way to go, and I pray that you'd bless it. I'm just going to trust you. And you, you little thing comes on, you know, need gas, you know, bing, bing. Gasoline, whatever it does, you know, bing. Lord, I'm just going to trust you. Fill up my tank. 
the Skinner Trophy Trail. Right. You're going to run out of gas. Yes. You're going to be on the side of the road. You can pray all you want. God's not going to fill up your tank. You see, it's not an easy road. God expects us to do some things. That's why it's a disciplined life. You're not saved by works by any stretch of the imagination. But there's some work involved. Fortification, verse number 9. Fortification. You've got to have an eye to watch. Yeah, pray about it. you got these enemies, but you know what? You better keep an eye open. You turned them over to God, but that doesn't mean they're not going to come over here after you. You better keep an eye out. Paul says, put on the whole armor of God. Peter says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. You better watch out. You better be looking out. You better walk circumspectly. Not as fools, but as wise. You better fortify. You better build up some things. You better watch out for some things. Let's look and see what some things to look out for while you're building. Verse number 10. You've got to watch out for fatigue. Verse number 10. Judah said the strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed. And there's much rubbish. You know, you had the people that battled, and you had the people that built but you had some people that bared the burdens. You know, some things in life, you, you deal with different things. A lot of you came up here and maybe you got to let go of some burdens for a few days. That feels good, don't it? Maybe you got away from work. Maybe you're able to sign out for a little bit and you let go of that burden. Uh, you let go of whatever responsibilities you got at the house. You just kind of you let that burden go for a little bit. But sometimes you can't let go of those burdens. I think about mothers. And sometimes you think about their job is pretty much never done. Right, true. They're always carrying a burden of those children and always trying to work and always trying to do those things. And you see those burdens. Sometimes you see it with uh, people that have uh, employees underneath them. And maybe in some of you, you have certain types of jobs where you're away, but you still got to be connected because you have such responsibilities. There's certain things... They're going to have to be checked. There's always a burden. As a pastor, the very night that I took that church 18 years ago, and I'm not speaking negatively, I felt a shroud like a burden fall on my shoulders. I'll never forget it. My wife and I left. We're going back to where I was from in Georgia that night to try to get things in line and be back within a few weeks. We sat in the Wendy's. Got us a good greasy hamburger, and I sat there and prayed, and I'm thinking, after I prayed, I was like, oh my God, I'm a pastor. <laughs> Man, there was some excitement, there's some enthusiasm, the butterflies, but then there's a burden. The responsibility of these people, their souls. And that, that, that never leaves. Never leaves. It's a good thing, but I'm just telling you, sometimes that burden can get heavy. And fatigue can wear you out. I want to share this with you. I shared it with our church. And um, I was reading George Patton's autobiography. Some of you may have read it. He was a missionary from Scotland down to the New Hebrides. And when he went down to the New Hebrides, they were not just what you would call heathen. They were cannibals. When those tribes would get to fighting with one another, they would kill you and eat you. Very common thing. And this is dangerous territory. And he gets down there and he takes his new wife and they're young and they're excited and they move down and she's with child and she has their first child. Everything seems to go good at first, but a couple of weeks in after the baby's born, the baby gets sick and then she gets sick. Both her and the baby died. Now George Patton, man, he kept going, plugging right along. He didn't come home. He didn't quit. He stuck it out. But here's the story. Five years later, he does go back to Scotland and he visits. And one of the first places he goes to is to his in-laws. And they were good Christians. And he loved his in-laws. And they loved him and they loved their daughter. But he said he made this statement about his in-laws. He said, you know, they never seem to recover from the loss of their daughter. But he wasn't being judgmental. But he said this. He said, that, and it blew me away. I underlined it. 
He said, even Jesus fell under the load of His cross. You're going to fall sometimes under the burden. Even Jesus fell under the load of His cross. That's okay. Righteous man gets tired. He falls. Falls seven times. We don't look at you and judge you when you fall. We just want you to get back up. You're going to get tired. The redundancy, you read your Bible and you pray and you try to be a testimony and go into church and, and all those things, you get wore out doing right. But you better watch out for fatigue. Elijah, man, that fatigue got Elijah. And I'm telling you, some of this stuff, it has to do with your physical health. It can affect your spiritual life. Elijah was down under that juniper tree and that discouragement and that depression and that despondency got a hold of him. And the angel of the Lord came down there and basically said, hey, you need to get some rest. You'll feel better after you get a nap. And you need some food. You need some nourishment. And you also need a touch from God. And he got that. Fatigue. The loss of strength. You better watch out for it. Look in verse 10 as well. Frustration. Frustration. You've got to build up yourself because frustration can wear you out. There's a loss of vision in verse number 10. There's much rubbish. They get to working and things are going well, but then they're like, man, there's still so much to do. Man, how am I going to do this? There's so much rubbish. You think you got one sin taken care of? And here's this other one you didn't even realize you were guilty of. <laughs> well, I was thinking about it when everybody's going crazy about that sin. What sins are you talking about? I was thinking, you know... We are so plagued with guilt. Every last one of us. We are all guilty. That's evident when you get to sing songs like that and you get to realize your guilt is taken away and your sins are taken away. Don't let make you feel so good because we are so consumed with sin. I think it was the great Calvinist A.W. Pink said in answer to the stupid adage, you know, God loves the sin but hates the sinner. I think Pink retorted... Um, what is in the sin but sin? What is in uh, the, the sinner but sin? Yeah. That's very good point. We are eat up with sin. Yeah. Every time you think, you know, you, you start looking at somebody, you know what you do? You know what I do? I start judging you, looking you up and down. Uh-huh. Don't look at me like that because you do me the same way. <laughs> you hypocrite. <laughs> we are eat up with sin. Sometimes it's a pride thing. You walk in a room and think everybody's looking at you. Nobody's looking at you. They're worried about you looking at them. We're we're infected with this thing. And you can look around and see all this rubbish and you see how much progress you need to make. And look, we need to press on to perfection. I love to see and get around spiritual brethren. You are an encouragement to me. It encourages me that maybe I can be more spiritual. I want to be more spiritual and less carnal. Man, I am sold under sin. Stinking flesh drags me down all the time. But you can sure get frustrated with it. You can beat yourself and kick yourself around the block. And you can live and have a defeatist attitude. And not have... Jesus wants you to have the victory. Even though you're carried around this robe of flesh. Frustration, loss of vision. You can't look at it what it looks like now. you got to look at it like what it's going to be. I told you the story probably before previous years about the painter, and he's working on this thing. Man, he thinks it's great. You know, it's got all these colors. looks like one of these new age paintings, you know, some blob up there. But he's working hard, you know, he's got it all. And his friend comes over and he's like, oh, let me show you my new masterpiece, what I'm working on. You know, he's got paint all over him. He goes, look, you know, and the, the guy's looking at it like... He goes, and then the painter says, oh, 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 I understand. You see it as it is now, but I'm looking at it like it's going to become. God looks at you and looks past your sins because He sees what you're going to become. So don't get frustrated with the lack of rubbish. Just keep building and keep battling and keep working. you got to watch out for fatigue. you got to watch out for uh, frustration, a lack of vision. you got to watch out in verse number 10, failure, a loss of confidence. 
Watch out for failure. We're not able to build. And you know, if you get around a bunch of complainers, you'll become a complainer. That's why he says, do all things without murmurings and disputings. Uh, sometimes God's trying to do something in somebody's life, and when you can be too sympathetic to their pain. I think I get that from Oswald Chambers. He's so deep, sometimes I can't get a hold of him. But I think he made that statement is, sometimes God's doing something, and you need to let God do His work. And just trying to be so sympathetic, and I know you hurt, and I know you're going through this, and blah, blah, blah. Hey, uh, go ahead and let God build a bridge, and you cross over and on the other side of it. Just go ahead and learn through it and realize that sometimes you're going to have failure, but the Bible still says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. You don't have to quit. And then verses 11 and 12, fear. The loss of security. Verses 11 and 12, the adversaries say, They shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. And it came to pass, when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times, From all places whence ye shall return unto us, they will be upon you. They're trying to get people to be afraid, and the enemy would try to keep whispering in your ear, you can't do this. You're going to lose. You're going to fail. You can't build up this wall. You need to quit listening to the adversaries and start listening to your advocate, Amen. Jesus Christ, the righteous. Fortification. All right, so we've got to have an eye to watch. Verse number 17. Verse 17. They which build it on the wall, they that bear burdens with those that laid it, everyone with one of his hands wrought in the work and with the other hand held a weapon. You got to have an eye to watch and you got to have a hand to fight. There's some that are bearing the burdens, there are some that are building, there's some that are battling. Hands are for working and hands are for warring. We are to war, we are to fight. There's a merging of caution and courage. You know, fear is just uh, uh, the, the uh, I forget, courage that said its prayers. I forget how that thing goes. But uh, courage is fear that said its prayers. And so when you think about your life and how that you're building and battling, you're going to have to realize you've got to have a hand ready to fight, and that means you have an offensive weapon, which is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Without the Scriptures, you're not going to be able to do this. You've got to quote some of these verses back to yourself. You've got to remind yourself of some of these things. And you're going to be like that mighty man in the Old Testament. The Bible says his hand clave unto the sword. Some of you, maybe you've done work out in the yard and stuff like that. I don't know. We're dealing with a different age. When I grew up, a hoe was a thing you used in the garden. When these people talk about hoes. I think of, hey, that's a thing you use in the garden. Anyway, I've been out working before and holding on to stuff, and your hand literally gets stuck on the, yes. the implement that you're holding. Yes. By the time you're done, if you didn't wear gloves, you're bleeding all right there. Some of you do you good to get a shovel and go dig a hole. Say, why? Just to dig a hole. Amen. Dig about a five-foot hole <laughs> and fill it back up. Be good for you. Yes. But you got to have a hand to fight and you hold on to that sword and so that, that Word of God becomes part of you. There's a merging there. Jude verse number 3 says, I gave diligence to write unto you the common salvation. It was needful to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. you got to have an eye to watch, but you got to have a hand to fight. Yeah. You've got to be ready for this thing because the enemy is going to fight. And you got to be ready to fight the enemy. Paul said, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. So we have fortification. Next, verse number 20, we have concentration. You've got to have a hand to fight. You've got to have an eye to watch. You've got to have a mind to work. You've got to have a heart to pray. But notice, concentration, verse number 20, you've got to have an ear to hear. He says, In what place, therefore, you hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye thither unto us, for God shall fight for us. So what they do, they've got people that are watching out, and if they blow the trumpet, they can tell people where to gather to to fight. You've got to have an ear to hear. This is good for me because I think about what we're doing up here. We're rallying. There's a rallying point. Sometimes like David, you know, when he got up in years, there was another giant. Like I said, this battle doesn't just take place when you're young and you get all the victories and then it's just smooth sailing when you get to the end of your Christian life. No, the end of your Christian life, I hate to tell it to you, but the end of your Christian life is going to be harder 
than the beginning. That's the end of the marathon. That's when you want to give up. That's when you're out of breath. That's when you're out of energy. The hardest part is at the end. David had got to the end of that thing, and here's another giant. A giant that had been studying him the whole time. Another giant that had a new sword. David couldn't handle him. He had to have help. There's a rallying point. Hey, I'm fighting over here, but I sure could use a hand. There's a rallying point, and then there's a relying point. He says, you know what? We get together, God's going to fight for us. Doesn't the Scripture say where two or three are gathered together, there is He in the midst of Him? Amen. Hey, there's something to that. Rally together and see what God can do. You've got to have a hand to fight. You've got to have an ear to hear. And you've got to have not just concentration. Verses 20 and 23, you've got to have dedication. They made up this thing. said, look, half of us, verse number 21, are going to have the spears from the rising of the morning to the stars appear at nighttime. Then we're going to send the next crew out. Verse number 23, So neither I nor my brother nor my servants nor the men of the guard which follow me, none of us put off our clothes, saving that everyone put them off for washing. There's dedication. There's dedication. There's a faith to stand. There's a faith to stand. You've got to stand your watch. Maybe it's going to be at midnight. Maybe you've got the third watch of the night. Maybe you've got second shift. Wherever you are in your place, that's your point where you've got to stand. Paul says, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Chapter number 5. Chapter 5. Scorn, now we have strife. Now we move, and here you are, and you're building your wall, and you know the enemy out there. Don't you know, it's good to know who's on whose side, isn't it? Uh, you see the ball teams, and they have different uniforms. You know, the visiting team in baseball, you know, they normally have the dark, dark uniform, and the home team's got the white, bright, shiny uniform. And uh, the teams, they have their uniforms. You can easily tell whose side it is. Back in the old days when they have the battles, you know, the north and the south, they have the standard bearer, and he's holding up the flag. The ensign, he's holding up the, the, the big flag. It's like, here you go, shoot at me. <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, one's wearing blue and the other's wearing gray and they stand about, you know, 50 feet apart and take 50 caliber and shoot at each other. Sound like a great plan to me, huh? Uh, but you can tell whose side. There's a story about a guy, of course, a lot of times during the, the war of northern aggression, you had... <laughs> that's kind of what happened, but... <laughs> during that conflict... <laughs> Y'all are neutral. You're out here in the West, man. It's like, hey, whatever goes. During that war, um, the Southerners, what they would do, because they were so depleted of resources, literally, if night would fall, they would go out on the battlefield and rip the clothes, especially the coats, off of the Yankees. And because they didn't have any coats, and they'd get their boots off and stuff. They didn't have any shoes. They'd strip the slain, like you read about in the Bible. And there's a story of a guy who had a blue coat on and gray pants. He got shot from both sides. (laughs) The idea is if if you know who the enemies are, you know, somebody's got their rainbow flag or they got whatever and they're standing there, you pretty much know what side they're on. But in chapter 5, we move from scorn and ridicule. That's pretty easy. You can deal with that. Okay, you don't love God. You don't love Jesus. You hate my guts. All right, I can deal with that. We move from scorn to strife. Scorn from the outside to strife on the inside. And you know what? Some of your biggest problems in your Christian life are going to come from the body of Christ. Friends and family. Those that are saved. And that's what we read about. We don't have time to go through it in detail in chapter 5, but this is an inner conflict. And what we have is a situation where you have literally families that have taken their kids and sold them as slaves so they could have money because of the inflation and different things have taken place. You have people that have sold their land to outsiders, those that aren't even Jews. They've mortgaged their properties. You have Jews in the passage that have said, hey, I'll let you borrow my tools, but I'm going to charge interest. That's against the Old Testament. It's called usury. And God said, you don't charge your brother usury. And you know, they were breaking all these laws. They had all this strife on the inside. 
When you're building your wall and you're trying to do something for God, the devil might not can reach you from the outside. Maybe the world doesn't have that much of appeal. Maybe you've broken ties with a lot of world. You know, I don't really have, I don't have a lot of friends that are not saved. Not anymore. I've been on this side of the fence for too long. Some of the greatest soul winners are those that are recently saved. Because they still have a lot of good, a lot of contacts out there. And so they can bring a lot of new people in really quick because they still have some connection. Once you're on this side for a long time, there's, there's not a lot of pull from there anymore. You know they're the enemy. They know you're the enemy. The scorn's there, but it ain't bothering you as bad. So the devil says, well, I can't get you there, but I can sure get you with your in-laws and outlaws. I can get you with your brethren, you know. You didn't get to teach a Sunday school class because the pastor favors so-and-so. They didn't call upon you to sing the special because they really don't like you. They didn't ask you to go out for coffee after service. They walked right by you and didn't even acknowledge that you were there. They didn't even shake your hand. You were going through a hard time and they didn't slip a $20 bill in your pocket. Nobody even cared. Nobody even asked. Boy, the devil can sure get in there. And then I tell you what, I do this often. That's size 10. Size 10 goes right in there a lot of times. You know, you're going to say something to hurt somebody. If I've said something to you to hurt you, I apologize. Even as a preacher, even behind the pulpit. If I say something from the Bible, I don't apologize a bit. If you're getting offended because it's of the Bible, shame on you. If you're offended because of me, shame on me. But I'm telling you, you're going to have strife on the inside and the devil will use the flapping tongues and he'll use the tender hearts and he'll use this very sensitive age. People are so thin-skinned. It's unbelievable. you got the backbone of a jellyfish. Get over it, man. Why are you so stuck on yourself? You say, no, I'm just very humble. No, some of the... Yeah, here's the thing. Some of the people that are supposedly so humble, they're just so self-conscious and so full of themselves that they easily get offended. We're dealing with a generation today, they, you just look at them wrong and they get offended. You're going to have to, you're gonna have to grow a backbone, I tell you. Uh, the pastor that I was or, uh, uh, under when I got ordained, we learned a lot of things. We, li- we were in a rough neighborhood up in Georgia. We did a lot of ministry with rough neighborhoods. And we learned a lot of practical ministry from him. He was an old Tennessee Temple graduate. And his wife told my wife, um, as soon as we got ordained and they had a nice uh, service and he preached and we had all the, the food and everything, she gave a little bit of advice. She says, you're going to have to... You're going to have to uh, be tough. And she says, you're going to have to be like, uh, you're going to have to be like a duck, and you're going to have to be like water on a duck's back. And you're just going to have to get over stuff quick. People are going to offend you. They're going to say something. They're going to talk about you. It's going to happen. It's amazing to me, especially down south. I've got south in the mouth, but I can criticize the south. <laughs> Amen. Southerners are bad about this. Here's what they're bad about. They're bad about blood being thicker than water. In other words, family rules the roost. A family comes in town and they're there on the weekend, they're just going to stay with their family and not even come to church because we got family in. Or they'll go out and family says, hey, let's go such and such and here's a family member and even though that family member is not doing right, not living for God, you know what they do? They still associate with that family member. Look, I know there's a fine line, but I'm telling you, you know what I've seen? I've seen Christians forgive wicked behavior. I'm talking about stuff the Bible says you need to put out that person from among you. If any man that is called a brother and he goes through the whole thing, be a fornicator, be an idolater, he says you need to put that person out. Don't even eat with that person. You know what I've seen Christians do? Well, they're family. And they forgive. They choose to forgive them simply because they're blood related. But a brother or sister that's in the church... A brother or sister that's not family can do some transgression that is very minute. Like, 
and they forgot to put their potato salad out for everybody to eat. Why didn't you put my potato salad out? What, what do you have against me? That's the sin of the South, man. You better put, if a woman cooks some food, you better eat it. You don't eat her food, man. You're the devil. When I first took my church, I gained like 50 pounds. I was eating all this food. And then I learned you can't please everybody. But here's what they'll do. They choose to forgive their blood kin, but they will not forgive their Christian brothers. You need to make a choice and choose. You know, love is not just an emotion you trip over and fall into. I just fell into love. Yeah, you fell into that bar over there, and that's why you fell in love with that guy. No wonder you married him. You couldn't see him inside that dark place. He's, he's got a face that'll make an undertaker cry. But anyway, love is not just this thing you fall into. You choose to love people. People choose to love family just because they're family. Well, you know, they're family. Well, they're part of our family. So I'm going to go over to their Christmas party. No, well, they're going to have alcohol over there. And you're going to go over there and say that you love Jesus on Sunday, and then Saturday night before, you're going to be over there around a bunch of alcohol. Really? Oh, how I love Jesus? Uh, I don't think so. You choose to love and forgive family but you won't choose to love the brethren. You need to just go ahead and choose. Hey, you can treat me wrong, but I'm going to love you anyway. Because you know what? Like Solomon said, you know, you, know, you hear somebody cursing you and you get all upset. He goes, you, you know that you, you, thou, thou likewise hast cursed others. You've said bad things and mean things to people. You're no better than them. Get over yourself. Okay, here's the points. Strife. Observation, verses 1 through 13. Nehemiah saw this going on. And Nehemiah, as the preacher, and this is a preacher's job, he's got to call it out. Okay? So there's observation. What is that? You have to have the character to correct the wrong. You have to have the character to correct. The character to correct. It takes a mature Christian to correct bad character, bad behavior. The character to, cor to correct. You know, a lot of people, they just want to pave over their problems. I was reading about this, this construction. You know how they have these big trucks and they put out that black, black top and then they come over and they pave over that stuff? Yeah. Well, they have those crews that go in front and they clear everything out and they make everything smooth. Well, there was a, a deer that had died and lo and behold, if they didn't leave that thing there and they just paved right over it. Wow. Oh. Of course, here's the thing. As you drive over that, you feel it every time you drive over it. Boom. A lot of people just pave over their problems. It's a bad thing to do. If you're going to deal with strife as you're trying to build this wall and work on your own, have you noticed that even though we're talking about your own relationship, we keep talking about others? I give this when I counsel young couples before they get married, and even married couples. 1 John chapter 1 talks about fellowship with God, and it talks about if we have fellowship with God, it says we have fellowship one with another. Amen. Here's God, here you are, here she is. You want to get close to each other? You've got to get close to the Lord. Amen. So your special place of fellowship is not going to be strong if you're at strife with your brothers and sisters. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Here's First Baptist Church. Here's Second Baptist Church. Here's Third Baptist Church. Here's Fourth Baptist Church. Here's this movement. Here's that movement. Split, 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 splinter, 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 splinter. It shouldn't be that way. But it is. Strife. Don't just pave over the problems. You need to recognize it. You need to have observation. Character to correct. And then contrition. Verse number 12. They said, we will restore them and will require nothing of them. So will we do as thou sayest. Then I called the priests and took an oath of them that they should do according to this promise. Contrition. The resolve to restore. Contrition. This is, okay, I'm getting serious about this now. Contrition. Resolve to restore. 
We're going to pay back the interest that we took. We're going to take these things back that we wrongfully did. We're going to make right the wrongs that we did. We're going to reconcile this strife. You want to build a wall? You want to have a better place with Jesus? You better reconcile some things. You better bring restoration. And then in the last part of the chapter, Nehemiah makes mention of how he didn't require the assistance of the governor. The last few verses of the text. And he says this in verse 19, look at it. Think upon me, my God, for good, according to all that I've done for this people. Observation, contrition, demonstration. We're dealing with strife on the inside. Demonstration. The example to set. The character to correct, the resolve to restore, the example to set. You know, you're building this wall... And it's not that big of a deal if it's just a little small wall. If it's just eight people in San Jose or whatever, eight people, that's not a big deal. Start getting 10, start getting 12, start, hey, uh, now we have to get a building. Oh, hey. You mean this uh, build? You mean there's more than just a couple of kooks coming out? <laughs> now there's a whole group of kooks coming out. Some people call us in our town the crazy church. Yeah, that's okay. I can, I can. That's a compliment. That's a compliment. That church. That church. That's okay. But there's an example here. There's a demonstration. Nehemiah leads by example. There's certain things he hasn't done because there's an example to set. D.L. Moody said this, A holy life will produce the deepest impression. Lighthouses blow no horns. They only shine. Lighthouses blow no horns. They only shine. I'm not telling you there is not a time that you need to speak up. We know that. But boy, Nehemiah is able to step out and he's able to say the things with weight and with power behind them because he has set that example. And all these heathen people are watching this little bitty wall go up. Now it's starting to get halfway up. And this thing, they put out all this trash now they're seeing all the, uh, you know, the uh, Arabian CDs and all the other uh, uh, videos and magazines and all the worldly stuff is all set outside and is all outside of the city. They're starting to see this big wall of separation. This thing is a big deal. And the devil tries to use that strife on the inside. Hey, man, there's a bigger picture at stake here. It's awful when you see... Brothers and sisters, maybe you haven't seen it. Praise the Lord. If you're new to this and you got saved, like Dr. Rutman says, he thought he was shaking the hands of angels. Little did he know. Maybe you think it's, oh, every day is not summer camp experience. Let me just put it that way. Sometimes you will see brothers and sisters in Christ who used to get along, who used to run around laps together. You'll see them screaming at one another. And some of you, maybe you grew up in homes, thank the Lord, I did not. My parents did not fight in front of me. I never saw that. So I didn't have to deal with that, thank the Lord. But I know some people have had to see that. Here's two people that they dearly love, and they think that they love them, and they say words of love, and they have their family together, and everything's great. And then they watch when mother and father are screaming at each other. And they see the strife, and the little kid sees that, and it just makes him sick to his stomach. As he watches the two people he loves hating one another. The devil loves to see that. He loves to see the brethren hate one another. Don't pave over the problems. Deal with it. Because if the devil can't get you on the outside, he's going to get you on the inside. Now, chapter 6, and we'll wrap it up. Sedition. Sedition. Chapter 6, verse 1, It came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had builded the wall and that there was no breach left therein, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? Yet they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same manner. 
This is sedition. In other words, they're trying to subvert the cause of God. It's not a blatant um, frontal attack. And the devil might not can come right through the front, but he wants to try to get in at another angle. And here we have Nehemiah prompted with this. And notice the first point is this, disassociation. Nehemiah has to disassociate. There's a disassociation. A request to refuse. A request to refuse. He says, hey, let's compromise here. Come down to one of these villages. Come down to the plain of Ono. That is the first sign that's a bad idea. You say, why? Oh, no. You know, these churches that split and make another church, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day and they were talking about they came out of a split, off another split. It's like the third church from this split or whatever. You know what they should have called? They should call those churches? Oh, no, another Baptist church. Oh, no, another Baptist church. Anyway, come down here to Oh, no. Here's the thing about it. Oh no, according to the scholars, about 25 to 35 miles from Jerusalem. He's trying to draw him out. The devil will try to draw you out from the protection of your place. Try to get you alone to do business with you. You remember Eve? The devil got Eve off where she would listen to him. She should have been listening to her husband, but she was listening to the devil. And she would have went back to her head. And by the way, Adam was first formed, then Eve. The man's not the head of the home because of the fall of man. The man's the head of the home because that's the order of how God made it even before sin came into the world. Ladies, the devil will get in your mind. And he's going to get in your mind to get into your heart because what he'll try to do is to convince you that something is right. And once your emotions are turned, you're all in. A guy will do something even though he knows it's wrong. You ladies in here, you're not going to do it unless you're convinced it's right to do. But he'll draw you out and get you to a place where he can have conversation with you. I'm telling you, you're not, you're not big enough to go to battle with him. Just disassociate. Well, I might win him. No, you're not going to win him. We form a Jehovah's Witness here and I've dealt with a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses through the years. I've learned my method that typically works, not for conversion. I've never led a, led a Jehovah's Witness to the Lord. I've led a Mormon to the Lord before, and it took about four hours. It took a long time. A lot of work, and our church member had already been dealing with the young man. It took a lot of work. I've never led a Jehovah's Witness to the Lord straight out. But here's what I'll do. As soon as they come, I'll find out which one's only been in it for a little while. And I go after them. I don't worry about The guy's been in it 30 years? Forget it. And I focus on that one. And I try to make them mad real quick and try to bring out that hatred from their hatred toward Jesus Christ and trying to point them to Jesus Christ. But here's the thing. What they'll try to do is to draw you out and get you to where you're going to go toe-to-toe. There's a lot of Christians that aren't ready to go toe-to-toe with a Jehovah's Witness on their doctrine yet. They jump in there and say, yeah, I know Jesus. I'm like, well, you say Jesus is God. Why was He praying to God the Father in John 17? And you might not even be familiar with that passage yet. And they start throwing all this stuff at you and you're sitting there, you know, going back and forth and you might not be ready for that. You say, what do you need to do? You say, hey, here's a track. I'll take your track if you take mine. And if they don't, just say, we'll see you later. I'm not going to talk with you. Maybe you're not ready for that. You don't have to go toe-to-toe with every, every enemy out there. Just, just back up. Just bow out. Disassociation. A request to refuse. Paul said, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. 2 Corinthians 2.11 The world, verse number 3, will always try to get you to come down from where you are. They're going to try to drag you down from that special place of fellowship. Let's just talk about this. I know you're going to this King James only church now, and I know they're a little bit weird. Look, trust me, I've been in this for a long time. Let's just sit down and you just stay out of church for a little while and come to my church for a few weeks and just let's just talk about this. Nope, the world says come down. You don't need to listen to them. It's easier for them to drag you down than for you to pull them up. 
You have to watch those associations that you have. If you can win them for Christ, praise the Lord. Tell them, say, hey, come to church. I'll see you at church. Yeah. Well, no, I want to, you know, I'd like, I'd, I'd, like, I'd listen to you talk about Jesus, but uh, have a beer with me and we'll go down to a place and we'll have a beer and you can tell me about Jesus. Nope, sorry. Come to church and you can learn all about Jesus, but I'm not going to go have a beer with you. Well, you just don't love them. No, you're a fool, I'm telling you. You're a fool. They're going to bring you down. No, use your compassion against them. Don't you feel so sorry for them? No, don't feel sorry for them. Give them the gospel and leave it up between them and God. Disassociation, there's a request to refuse. The world will always try to get you to come down. Notice he has the right action. You know it's the right action because he's still able to focus on his great work. He says, hey, this is a great work. It's a great thing you're doing trying to build your relationship with Jesus. It's a great thing you're doing trying to build this wall. It's a great thing you're trying to do. Focus on your relationship with Jesus. Don't let somebody spoil that. Don't let them ruin that. Don't sacrifice the permanent on the altar of the immediate like Bob Jones Sr. used to say. Don't come down, not even for a minute. They're going to drag you down. They're going to get their hooks in you. They'll put their lies into you. You better watch it. He took the right action. And he had the right answer. You say, what's the right answer? Open rebuke. Reveals the truth. That passage in Proverbs, was it? 26. He says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. But then he says, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. You've got to have the right answer. Sometimes, yeah, you give them a little verse and you tell it to them. Sometimes you just go on. But I pray for God to give you the discernment Disassociation, a request to refuse. Nehemiah's thinking like this. He's thinking it's not reasonable to leave. It's not feasible to leave. And then he gets to the place, it's not possible to leave. I'm doing a great work. The priority of serving God is greater than pacifying men. I don't feel sorry. I get tons of phone calls. My church phone number, it goes straight to voicemail. I check it. I hadn't checked it even this week, but people that really know our church, they, they can get a hold of me. You get all these calls, you know, people wanting all kind of things. Our church has been there since 1940. We are in the loop of every organization you can imagine. Oh, we have a great Southern Gospel group, and we would like to stop by your church on Sunday night. We just ask that you give at least $1,000 to take care of our expenses. Can we count on you to have us there for Sunday night? Click. I don't have time for that mess. Who's got time for that garbage? Hello, I'm an evangelist, and I believe the Bible just like you, and I'd like to come. Oh, you want me to let... I've never heard you, don't know you, and you, let, you think I'm going to let you stand up and preach in front of my people? They trust me with who I let in the pulpit. I don't even let some missionaries preach. You think I'm going to let you stand up and preach to my people? you got to be crazy. I don't feel, don't feel bad about turning down some people about some of the things. Well, you know, I just don't want to hurt their feelings, you know. They know I'm saved and they know I love Jesus. And if I don't go out to ice cream with them, or if I don't go out to coffee with them, or if I don't go over to their house, or I don't go to the family reunion, or if I don't go to the birthday party, or if I don't go to fill in the blank. Oh, well. I love Brother Donovan when he was preaching Dr. Rutman's funeral. One of his points... And his funeral was. Now, here, let's talk about Zonk, man. We could do Zonk on Dr. Rutman's funeral. It's bad when you remember points of a funeral. But one of his points about the eulogy of Dr. Rutman, I love it. It stuck with me. He said, Dr. Rutman didn't give a flip. He didn't give a flip. You do what God tells you to do and don't give a flip. They want to coax you and coerce you and try to get you to come with them. And the more you listen, the better it's going to sound. You ever watch any of those infomercials? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Infomercials, you know, they have this miracle drug. Oh, yes. You know, I was flipping through the other day. Um, I don't watch TV just because I hate commercials. But we have this, we I, have, I'm a, I have a problem, uh, a hang up with, I like old time westerns. You know, John Wayne, the Duke, you know. I, I just like that stuff, you know. But anyway, that's a nemesis. I'm flipping through there, and here's Mike Huckabee. Mike Huckabee was this politician. He used to be a Baptist preacher, and he took a demotion and became the governor of Arkansas. Amen. 
He's a bass player and plays stupid rock music, but who knows? He's a Southern Baptist, so that fits. Anyway, <laughs> here's Mike Huckabee selling sleeping pills <laughs> on some kind of infomercial. And I got to laugh into that thing. But you know what? If I sit there and watch it long enough, I'll be thinking, hey, I'm, that's, that sounds pretty good. I might need to get some of that. You see Chuck Norris, you know, he's 150 years old, and he's, <laughs> he's doing some infomercial, you know, or some workout thing, and you watch it long enough, and you're like, oh, yeah, man. Hey, only 35 payments of $150. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think I can do that. Some of you, you better watch who you listen to. I'm not trying to be mean to you. Some of you, you may be smart. I have known some smart people that were very gullible. You better watch that stuff, man. So anyway, we've got to move on. A request to refuse. Just tell them, hey, Dr. Rutman didn't give a flip, so I ain't going to give a flip. All right, so we have disassociation, verses 1 to 4, verses 5 to 9, repudiation, repudiation. Verses 5 to 9, what happens here? Now they go to defamation of character. Now they write this letter. In modern terms, now they're tweeting, now they're texting, now they're whatever the other stuff is out there, Facebooking, whatever the stuff is, now they're talking about you. And they're putting the stuff out there. There was a request to refuse, now there's an inquisition to ignore. An inquisition. Now they're bringing up this controversy and they're trying to say things about your character. We had before chronic pressure. Now we have cancerous pressure. Defamatory pressure. We have literally a threat being made. The devil, man, I'm telling you, he will ramp this thing up. He don't have anything to lose. He's going to push it, and he's going to push it, and he's going to try to stop you, however he can stop you. An inquisition to ignore, ignore. Verse number uh, 8, He said unto them, There are no such thing done as thou sayest. Thou feignest them out of thine own heart. For they all made us afraid, saying their hands shall be weakened from the work, that it be not done. Now therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Afterward I came into the house of Shemaiah, verse number 10, the son of Delilah, the son of Mahzabil, who was shut up. And he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us shut the doors of the temple, for they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night will they come to slay thee. And I said, Said such a man as I flee? And who is there that being as I am would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. And lo, I perceived that God had not sent him, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me. For Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. Therefore was he hired that I should be afraid and do so in sin, and that they might have matter for an evil report, that they might reproach me. Nehemiah knew the Bible. He's not a priest. It's not for him to go hiding and going in that holy place. Notice we move from repudiation and inquisition to ignore to detection. An invitation to decline. Detection. Nehemiah... Is, has some discernment here. This guy's trying to put the pressure and say, hey man, you need to go hide. You know, you're the main guy. You better go get in the temple and you better go hide. And Nehemiah's like, no, that doesn't ring right. You better be in your Bible. You better be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. So when somebody says some things to you, and you that don't ring right. You know, you're out talking and they say, yeah, you know, it was a pretty good message today, you know. It's pretty good except, you know, when the preacher said such and such, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, us preachers, hey, we're stupid. I understand that. We make mistakes and all, but... Yeah. You know, I agree with the pastor almost, almost about everything, but you know, that one doctrine he was teaching the other day, I just don't know about that. You know, I know that most of the Christians we hang around, they're real strong about separation and stuff, but you know, I think that we can't reach people unless we can touch them a little better. And you know, I think that... Mm, you can justify any type of sin you want to get into 
if you just keep on talking and you listen long enough and you talk long enough and you get somebody to talk. A lot of times people, the reason they ask for counsel and advice, they're trying to get you to talk and justify what they've already made up their mind they're going to do in the first place. In the multitude of words, they're one if not sin. Better watch that stuff. An invitation to decline. He, it doesn't ring right with him. He's like, no, I don't, I'm not going in there. And why are you telling me this? Then he's realizing, you know what? They've done got a hold of you and you're not speaking the truth of God. Yeah. Finally, let's wrap it up. He prays. Verse number 14 again. Nehemiah is always praying. My God, think thou upon Tobiah and Sanballat according to the, their works and on the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets that would have put me in fear. The devil's going to try to get you one way or the other. But look in verse 15. So the wall was finished the 20th and 5th day of the month, Elul. Look at this. In 50 and 2 days. That's a miracle. All the workers. All the opposition that they had. Really the point with this, if you want to get a great number 13, would be, folks, there's a job to finish. There's a job to finish. God's got you building this wall of protection around that special place of fellowship. God's got you doing some things in your life and He's doing a work in your life. Paul says, I'm trying to apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. He says, we press forward to the mark of the high prize of God. He says, we're trying to do it to attain a better resurrection. We're, we're trying to go forward to finish something. There's a job to finish. A lot of you... You're going to get started. But unfortunately, a lot of people won't finish. Most of you know that I'm the Dean of Students for the Bible Doctrine Institute, and a lot of you have signed up and are taking the classes. Some of you are in between. Maybe you've fallen out for a little while, and you're going to jump back in. And we do have things in place for people to get back in. But I will say this. Unfortunately, it's the same thing with PBI. And it's probably the same thing really across the board with all types of education. A lot of folks show up and get started. But boy, that number dwindles down. Very few really finish. And maybe you started. And you're gung-ho and you're excited and you've taken these notes. And, but the devil wants to get you to stop somewhere along the line. You know what people remember when you look at those races? They don't... I mean, when it starts and the gun goes off and everybody takes off, you know, that's kind of... It's climactic, but it's not as climactic as the end. People don't remember how you start. They remember how you finish. There's these boys up north, and they were going around with their big shovels, big snow shovels. And they were getting jobs, you know, shoveling off snow of the sidewalks and of the driveways and stuff. And they came to a guy, and he was about halfway done. And uh, they said, hey, mister, we'd like to, can we make a few dollars? We'd like to shovel your driveway for you. He's like, can't you see I'm almost halfway done? They said, we know. That's why we asked. Because most of the people that we get our jobs from are people that started, but they couldn't finish. <laughs> I so like a lot of Christians. Start off, man. They're in. But then there's the devil knows that little monkey wrench to fix you. Remember Sam, and I'll close with this. Remember Samson? Yes. Early on, he had trouble with women. Early on. And the devil, man, he just he kept at it. There's that little harlot down there in the valley. And then finally he just kept keeping on and keeping on. And he found, after he got married, went through that whole deal, he found a woman that not just caught his eyes, but caught his heart. He loved Delilah. And the devil said, I got you now. One thing I think that the role as I look at some of the families that I know of that have good families, and I know there's some here, you've got really good families. It's a blessing to see these young people and how they, I guess the best word is they blossom into their spiritual maturity. Man, we got a group of young people at our church. Man, they're there because they want to be there. Man, we let some of the young guys, we let them take up the offering. They wear their suits and ties and they're ready to take up the offering. They bring their Bibles. They come to their youth class. They're reading their Bibles on their own. They're going out on their own, 
grabbing tracks and going out on their own inviting people to church. They, they've caught it on their own and they're blossoming into the young men and women that God wants them to be. It's not because they're being forced into it. But as I look back and I examine these families, what I notice is there's a balance of boundaries, boundaries and blessings, I guess you could call it, or a little bit of liberty, liberty and license, I guess, where the young person has the boundaries in place because they're not mature enough really to make certain decisions that could really get them into trouble. So they have to have walls up. And if early on, 12, 13, 14, they get hooked on stuff, the chances are they're going to be hooked on it when they're 40, 50, 60. Yes. But if you can get them past that critical time and you can get them in their early 20s, not hooked on drugs, not hooked on pornography, not hooked on social media, not hooked on bad music, if you can get past that age and you get over there, then they're going to be able to, they're kind of like they have the feet underneath them. And if you go through that transition and you watch them, they make some decisions on their own. And they say on their own, I'm not coming down. They say on their own, I want to read my Bible, not because I'm in trouble. And Dad said, go read your verses because you did wrong. They want to read their Bible because they want to read their Bible. And they grow in their faith. It builds a good wall. The devil wants to stop us. But hey, I hope you're in this thing to finish it. Amen. Are you here to finish it? Amen.